to be here for you tonight. And uh, I think it's an honour and a privilege to be preaching in Brother Bramlett's pulpit. And uh, I don't know, how's he going, all right? He's doing all right? I haven't heard from him. Yeah, that's all right. Good on him. Yep, praise the Lord. But um, I want to encourage you because um, I see churches are struggling today, especially Aussie preachers, because they all have to work and preach at the same time. So they're battling with the finances to try and live and then be a pastor at the same time. So they're doing two full-time jobs, most of them. So that's pretty hard. And... um, I found one church closed its doors only a couple of weeks ago up north and uh, another pastor's considering selling the building everything and that's down south. And that church been there for 30 years, the one down south. So um, I'm trying to encourage them and be an encouragement to say, keep going. It's just the nature, it's a day we live in, isn't it? It's a day we live in. We're in the last days. I believe we're on the verge of Christ coming. And that's why when you go and witness, people say, oh, I'm not interested. And Jesus said, when I come, shall I find faith on the earth? So I want to encourage you as a people of this church, just keep being faithful. Keep sticking in there and saying, I'll serve Christ. You're not serving me or the past, Pastor Bill. You're not serving the building. You're serving Christ, which is a lot different. And when we serve Christ, we come because of Jesus, not because of us. And uh, that's a great thing. I'm going to preach on tonight. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Andrew Van Komen. Most of you know me, but uh, just in case you didn't know me. And uh, I'm going to preach on coming to the cross. And uh, yes, I have preached this before. Uh, it's a message I got from my church. But uh, I'm not Mr. Mr. Uh, what do you call it? Perfect that I can produce a new message every time. Brother Carver can do it, but not me. No. <laughs> He just like pulls out a message like that. He's on worries on the go. Not, it's not like that easy, is it? Not that easy at all. But I didn't preach it this morning, so it's not. So it's going to be like a fresh one for you. So, First Corinthians chapter one and verse eighteen. Yeah, that's right. It's been warmed up. <clears throat> actually, I actually preach in a nursing home once every Tuesday. I go nursing home is like about five doors behind our block. So we jump the fence and go down the nursing home. The Lord burdened me at Christmas time. We went there at Christmas time to um, uh, do a Christmas play, you know, for the kids brought there. And the Lord really touched my heart and said, you know, no one's coming to see these people. And the Lord touched my heart to go to minister to them. So what I do is I use my Sunday morning message and I go there on Tuesday and preach. I only, sometimes only do it one point. And just basically just ad lib most of it, but they, they're so appreciative because they all got dementia, but they sort of remember me. So that's a blessing, isn't it? And, uh, but, they, but they're, you know, stuck. And I look at it, and there was one guy I was talking to, he's flat out on this bed. And I said, How old are you? And he said, I was born in 1953. And I said, That's only 10 years older than me. That's scary. And he's bedridden, dementia, and lost the plot, you know. but still happy and all but you think man we're really knocking on that door who knows something might go wrong up here and tomorrow I might not remember who I am you just don't know anymore and so it's scary 1 Corinthians chapter 18 so I'll go there and preach what I've got and it's a blessing and you'll warm it up again and uh, let's stand to read this passage verses 18 to 22 let's stand to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 sorry my apologies Chapter 18, verse 1. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 18. <laughs> the Van Komen version. Not, J- not King James, it's VK. <laughs> okay, verse 18, he said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which is, are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made the foolish foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews required a sign and the Greeks 
seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray and ask, Lord, that you would use me to encourage us tonight, that we would have some fellowship, that your Holy Spirit could speak to our hearts to bless us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, and to help us to see it's back to you, Lord Jesus, and that we could have your power in our lives. We ask in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Coming to the cross. You know, when, the, when you really come down to it, when your boils down to the end of the day, the bottom of the pot, when everything's said and done, we just come still get back to the cross. You run your Christian life and you go for it all your life, but when you get to the end of it, you just come back to the cross. It's just got to come back to simple, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why Paul preached. He said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And he comes back to preaching the cross. The cross is where our Lord Jesus Christ died. It's where the answer to most of life's problems still lie today. You say you've got a problem? What's wrong with it? Is it on? It's on. <clears throat> but it's recording. It's recording. You can hear me. Can you hear me at the back all right? Can you hear me at the back, Ezra? I'll, re I'll yell louder if you want. I'm used to it. I don't have audio in our church, and, uh, but uh, I'm used to it. Oh, by the way, I never told you, we've actually lined the, our building. Did, we painted it and lined it, painted it a nice blue at the back. And uh, uh, what was the colour? And so like a, a, a windswept, windswept beach or something on the side. And it's a, like, a, like, a, like a grey with a blue tint in it. And the ceiling is a love note. And when the sun shines in, the, the colour of the wall reflects up into the ceiling. It's really wonderful. And um, it's uh, uh, got heaps of down lights. It's very bright. And the acoustics is unbelievable. It's echoes. <laughs> it's echoes. You only have to whisper and Azra would hear it. And so it's a blessing and I appreciate your prayers. But let me get back into this message. And... Uh, the cross is where Christ died. It's where the answer to our problems lie today. Most of your problems, you've got a problem, you've got to bring it to the cross. And you'll find the answer to your problems in the cross. Whenever Paul preached, he preached great things. But the first port of call was he preached Christ. He preached Christ and him crucified. And then he preached that uh, he's the God of all things that created all things. He came and walked among men. Jesus was the one willing to give himself to die. And uh, Jesus rose again from the dead to live forevermore. And when he had fi finished teaching and preaching and ta training and organizing and, and encouraging and building the believers up, he came again and went back to the cross. He just went back to the cross. I like it. I was reading a passage and uh, where Jesus was teaching his disciples. I think it's in... Uh, 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 Matthew chapter 11 and he said when he finished teaching his disciples he went out and preached he just went back to the cross went back to preaching to the cross and when we're finished uh, our day we'll just come back to the cross that's what you've got to do come back to the cross so the first point is Jesus came to the cross he came to the cross. When we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we find he came to the cross as well. And uh, the first we find Jesus came to his creation. He made the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. And uh, as God in amongst the world and he made all things, as it says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And when we see Jesus as the creator, how he made the whole earth, he made light, he separated the firmament from the firmament, divided the waters, he created all the grass and the herb and yielding seed and the fruit trees. He created then the sun, the moon and the stars. And then he created the birds and the fish in the sea. He created all the land animals and he did all this. He created everything. He got it all ready for his special creation, which is man. Man is God's special creation because he made man in the image of himself, didn't he? 
He said, let us make man in the image of ourself. And uh, he didn't make man in the image as in uh, our looks, because I believe, I don't believe Jesus would look this ugly. Uh, you know, I believe he had, uh, he had a look that was not special. We've all got a special look, you know. We are identifiable in our own self. But Jesus was without form. There was no comeliness. He was so unnoticeable that he could walk through a crowd and people wouldn't notice him. When they went to throw him off the cliff, he walked straight through the middle of them and they didn't notice it because his face was nothing special. We've all got something special about our face. It might be a big nose or something, but we've got something special about our facial features. But we are made in his image in the sense of we have a body, we have a soul and we have a spirit. And God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. We're made in His image and the likeness of Him. And so he, when He made us all, he, he, he created man in His own image, and He made all of creation just specially for man, but then it was man who sinned against God. It was man who disobeyed God. God said you can eat all the trees of all the trees of the garden, but there's one tree you can't eat and that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And man was tempted and he ate. He ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So you say, where does all this sin come in the world? It's from man. Man did it. It's man's problem. And uh, it was man who sinned against God and it was man who caused the curse to be upon the earth. Wonder why there's trouble in the earth? It's not God's fault, it's our fault. It's man's fault. Man did it. You wonder why there's wars in the world? You can't blame God. It's man that's doing it. It's man's selfish, uh, wicked, sinful greediness that wants to get what he wants. In fact, I've found a lot of wars now, it's all changed. The ball game's changed. You know, up to about the Second World War, it was a war about who owns what land. But now it's changed. The ball game's changed. It's not about who owns what land because the rulers are in every land. So it's not about claiming land ownership, it's about claiming uh, world dominance. That's what the new game is. That's why the same battle we're facing is the same battle every other country's facing. And, you know, they're saying, you know, like, what's the, what's the battles today they talk about? Oh, global warming. Well, global warming is not a global warming, it's a global governance. Uh, you know, like uh, you think about what's another battle we get told about. It's, uh, um, uh, let me try to think what's another one we get told. Oh, I don't even. Free trade. free trade. Is it free? It's not free. It's not, tr not free. There's lots of things like that. And, you know, like uh, even uh, pollution. Well, pollution is a battle. Um, well, I was just trying to think of something else that was uh, uh, economic troubles. It goes right across the globe. Immigration is a big trouble now. But all these battles we see and we're led to believe, and you know, they've, somebody's worked it out that when you go to war, you're willing to wear restrictions and the cause of the war. Uh, terrorism is a good one, isn't it? The new battle is terrorism. That's a good one. And, uh, but who created terrorism? Like really, who created all of terrorism? You have to ask that question. And how come they know so much about it when it's, we don't know anything about it, you know. And all of a sudden, now when we go to the airport, we have to get screened, we get x-rayed, uh, uh, or you have to, if you don't want to go through the x-rays, you have to be subjected to a pretty inhumane sort of a practice. And, uh, you know, there's lots of things about terrorism that we're willing to uh, go through restrictions. I was in the train station and I had a bit of rubbish in my hand and I've got no rubbish bin. There's no rubbish bin in train stations. Who noticed that? Yeah, you know why? Because they don't want a bomb threat. They don't want someone to drop a bomb in the rubbish bin. Come on, where, really? <laughs> uh, you know, and people are willing to restrict. We're told to throw rubbish in the rubbish bin. We can't. There's no rubbish bin. So we throw it on the ground. Oh, you're done for littering. And there's cameras everywhere, isn't there? So what do you do? You know, that's the way it is. So... It's man that causes these wars upon us. It's man that causes problems to come upon us. But God knew all this would happen. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows the direction that everything's going. That's why he sent the Lord Jesus Christ. He says he was foreordained. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. 
what we find out when the Lord Jesus created the world, when God looked at creation, the first thing he did, he says, we know we want to build a creation. We know man has all these needs, but his first and primary need is he needs a saviour. He needs someone to come to the cross. He needs the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when the Lord Jesus came, born of a virgin, dwelt among men, and he showed us he was God by his miracles. And, and then we find uh, he came as he was foreordained to his creation. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He saw your need before you even knew you had a need. He saw your problems before you even knew you even had a problem. When we was young, we thought everything's okay. When we grow older, we find out, man, I've got some real dramas in my life. And, uh, but he knows those problems. And that's why God the Father said, we need a saviour before man is created. And he created man, but he already foreordained, he already set it aside. He said, I'm going to set Jesus to be the saviour of the world. He's going to come before I make man. He's already set it in plan. And so Jesus came to this world. And secondly, we see about Jesus, he was obedient to go to the cross. And I like this in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we find that Ephesians Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse 5. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so we see uh, God the Father uh, sent the Lord Jesus Christ, but Jesus came and he was obedient even to go to the cross. He knew he had to go to the cross. Jesus came and he knew his job was to go to the cross. He knew he had to be beaten of men, whipped of men, and tortured of men, and spat upon, and had rods hit upon him, and then be, have a crown of thorns jammed on his head, and then be uh, crucified on the cross. He knew that. I mean, we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't even know really what our plan is tomorrow. We can uh, sort of get the will of God. We can sort of know what to do. But really, we're only sort of like uh, half knowing what's going to happen. When Jesus came, he was born in the, as a virgin and he said, I'm going to the cross. That's my job. I'm going to go to the cross. All those 30 years before he was uh, baptised, before he started his ministry, he was working with Joseph, everything, and he just said, I oh, know I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. When he went and got baptised by John the Baptist, in his heart, in his mind, he said, this is the beginning of me going to the cross. He knew he was going to go to the cross. And he was obedient to go. He was obedient to go there. We find in the book of Matthew's Gospel, three times Jesus clearly said to the disciples he was going to go to the cross. Three times. If you went to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. There's other times he said it, but this is the clearest you can find that he said, I'm going to the cross. And he told his disciples clearly. Matthew 16 verse 2. And we find... Uh, no, so 21, sorry, uh, where Jesus said in verse 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. And then we find Matthew 17, just the next page. Maybe a few events happen, but then Jesus clearly says in verse 22, he's talking to his disciples. He said, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. And then if you went to Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. Matthew 20, verse 17. I've got these marked in my Bible because I find they're, they're pinnacle things to know about the Lord Jesus. Matthew 17, uh, 20, verse 17, he said, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, 
Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Here's Jesus telling the disciples very clearly that he will be beaten and then he will be crucified. He said, I'm going to the cross. And three times clearly he said to them, I'm going to the cross. And they were exceeding sorry. And then later on he says, oh, we're coming to Jerusalem. I'm going to the cross. He knew he had to go to the cross and he was obedient to go to the cross. Man, how would we feel? I'm going to go into town today and I'm going to get beaten up and I'm going to get whipped up and I'm going to be uh, mocked at and I'm going to be uh, spat on and I'm going to go to get crucified. I'm going. Have a nice day. It, it, we wouldn't do it. We would run. <laughs> That's us. We would run. But he said, I'm going to be obedient to the call to go to the cross. I'm obedient to what my father has sent me to do. And he, you think about it, he could have delivered himself from being crucified. He had the power to do that. Uh, If you went to John's Gospel in chapter 18, when they went to arrest him, they said, we're looking for someone. And he said, who do you seek? And they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And what did he say? I am he. And this is what the scripture says in verse 2. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Do you think he didn't have the power to wipe them out? He could have just spoke the word and they would have been fried on the spot. He would have only had to say a word and they would have been finished right there and then. Disorientated. He could have done anything. Or well, he had the power. Remember, he went to the fig tree and he said, From henceforth no man shall eat of this fig tree. And it died. And the disciples were marveled. No man just speaks to a fig tree and it dies. I mean, you can get a fig tree and poison it and thrash it and ring bark it and it will still live. They are the most hardiest trees out. And we, I lived in a place in, and uh, we had a fig tree on the driveway and it was like really a small driveway and here's this huge fig tree growing in the driveway. The neighbours were not impressed. It's ripping up their concrete and they would dump poison on this thing. They would chop the roots underneath the ground. They did everything but that fig tree still produced figs. It, was, <laughs> it still rained figs on the car. It was like you couldn't kill it and yet uh, Jesus spoke to this fig tree. It died. When Jesus spoke, a boy raises from the dead. When the leper comes, he said, I will, thou be clean. And the leper left him. When when someone came, the the Syrophoenician woman came and said, my my daughter is possessed with the devil. And he said, be it done unto you because your faith is great. He didn't even go and see and the devil was cast out of her. When the the centurion came to him and said, look, I'm a man of authority and I tell men to come and go and all I need is my servant to be healed. And Jesus said, I've never seen so much faith. Be healed. And he didn't even go and visit him and this boy was healed from his sickness. Do you think he wouldn't had the power to have life and death in his tongue he had the power of life and death in his tongue and he could have spoke to those people and said look just go away and they would have left and wouldn't have known how they did it they would have walked away he could have done anything but no he just said I am he they fell over as a demonstration I'm the most powerful one that you're arresting and I'm allowing you to do it Uh, He could have had help from angels. In Matthew chapter 26, he told the disciples when they thought to try and protect him with a sword and they thought they were gallant to uh, deliver Jesus. He said to Peter, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? That would wipe everything out, wouldn't it? I mean, how much damage does one angel do? Remember David when he numbered Israel? And when David numbered Israel and the Lord said, what would you have as a judgment? And David chose, I'll have the judgment of the hand of the Lord because I know the Lord is merciful. And so the Lord sent a angel that killed, I think it was 10 or 20,000 or even 30,000. I can't remember the number, but thousands of people were dying because of this one angel with a flaming sword. Imagine 12 legions of angels. Not just one angel. Remember Balaam and Balak? And Balaam was riding his donkey and the angel stood in the way and the poor old donkey crushed his leg and and turned out the side and everything and laid down because he said, I can see the angel, that's pretty scary. And Balaam couldn't see the angel and if he ran into it, he would have died straight away. Angels are huge, they're powerful. 
They're, they're forceful. Remember Daniel when he was praying and then when the angel came to him and Gabriel, I think it was Gabriel, came to him and he said, oh, we had to fight the devil on the way here. And, uh, and so he had a battle there. So angels are very powerful. And yet Jesus said, I could call 12 legions of angels and my father would send them. But he didn't because he said, I want to be obedient to go to the cross. I'm obeying to go to the cross. I'm willing to obey what I need to do. And he willingly obeyed the Father's will to go and be beaten of men and then be crucified. Isaiah said in 50, it said, I gave my back to the smiters. I let them have their run on my back. I let them whip my backs and my cheeks to them that plucked their off the hair. And I hid not my face from shame and spitting. This is what the Lord went through. He willingly went to there. He willingly let them spit on him. I hate it when people spit at you. That's horrible. You ever been street preaching and someone spits at you? That's horrible. And uh, it's one of the grossest things out, but people do it. And yet Jesus willingly let these men spit on him. He willingly let them rip his back up with whips. And he willingly let them beat his cheeks and rip the beard off his face. So he was a man, he had a beard. Jesus had a beard. (laughs) <laughs> I don't. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, but we know he had a beard because he said he'd rip it off. And yet he willingly obeyed his father's will and he came to the cross. He came to the cross. Matthew chapter 27, and they crucified him. And Jesus came and let wicked men crucified him. And uh, he was laid on his back on the wood, all ripped up. They laid him on his back on the wood, stretched out his hands, put the nail spikes into his hands and nailed him into the cross and put his feet, put a spike straight through both feet in one feet. Then they lifted up that cross and they dropped it in a hole. Just dropped it in a hole. I don't know if you know what building's like and you have a hole in the ground and you drop a post in that hole that's about four feet deep. That post, when it goes down, it hits the bottom, it goes thunk. And everything on that post just falls off like that. It just shakes. And uh, Jesus is hanging on the cross. That's why it says all his bones were out of joint because he's hanging on the cross. And when that post hit the ground, it just went boom and all his bones got pulled out of joint. That would be pretty painful. And he willingly went to the cross. And, uh, and then we find, uh, thirdly, Jesus rose again. He willingly went to the cross, but as he said in Matthew 20, verse 19, and the third day he shall rise again. He knew he would rise again. He said after going to the grave for three days and three nights, he would rise again. And, and so we find on the first day of the week, on that Sunday after the uh, crucifixion, Jesus rose from the dead. He became the first man to rise from the dead, never to die again. You know, there was men in the Bible who were resurrected. Lazarus was raised from the dead and there was a few others raised from the dead, but they had to actually die again. They had to go back to death. But Jesus is the first and only man so far that was raised from the dead never to die again. He will never die again. He is resurrected forevermore. There's two men in the Bible who never died. They're going to have to come back and die. And that's Enoch and Elijah. But Jesus, he was the only man to rise from the dead and then ascend, go up into heaven bodily. And so the cross was important to Jesus, for he knew he had to go to the cross to be our sin bearer. He knew he would uh, become our only way of salvation. He did it because he loved us. He did it willingly because he loved us. You know, that's why we serve God, isn't it? Because we love him. And that's why we come to church. I try and teach people and I try and convey this idea in the hearts of everyone we come to church we serve the lord because we love him no that's the best motivation it will help you get through every every day of this discouragement when you realize i'm doing it because i love the lord i'm not doing it for you sitting next to me i'm ministering to you sitting next to me because i love the lord and if I love the Lord, I'll love my man, fellow man. Isn't that what the two commandments is? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your strength and all your might and love thy neighbour as thyself. That help, that'll get you through every service you go through. And so uh, Jesus, uh, uh, what am I saying, sorry? <clears throat> he, he become our sin bearer because he loved us. 
And he willingly went to the cross because he loved us. And so we willingly serve because we love him. And, uh, and he knew he would become our only way of salvation. He knew he would rise again from the dead so that he could go to heaven and then he could send his Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. And his Holy Spirit will give us the power to do right. It will give us the power to uh, love him greater than what we could love ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, you've got to forgive yourself sometimes. You've got to learn to forgive yourself. You've got to learn to love yourself and forgive yourself. That's really important. That'll help you, sister. You've got to learn to say, I love myself. I, I thank you, Lord, that you love me and I'm going to love you. And, I, and you know, like you think about it, if Jesus w willingly gave himself to uh, uh, forgive us, we've got to learn to say, I can forgive myself. You know, we, we ask God to forgive us and Jesus forgives us, but are we willing to say, Lord, I just need to forgive myself? And, and, and like the Lord loves us, are we willing to say, Lord, I'm going to learn to say, I love me? That'll help you because that, that got me through a really big hurdle in life as a young man. I had to come to that place of saying, well, God loves me. Why shouldn't I love me? And instead of hating myself instead of, and downcasting myself and putting myself down, we need to say, oh, the Lord forgave me. I'll forgive myself. I can forgive others. Why not forgive yourself? And, uh, and, uh, and so when we trust on the Lord Jesus Christ to give us his free gift of eternal life, then we can receive his Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us and live in us and give us the power to come to him. And so the second point I have here, Jesus came to the cross. Will we come to the cross? Will we come to the cross? Have a look in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke, John. Uh, Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. He said, Jesus speaking, and he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If you're going to come after me, you've got to take up your cross and follow him. You've got to take up your cross. Uh, really, to be saved... We first need to come to the cross. We need to come to the cross first. To be saved, to know you have eternal life, you need to come to the cross. We need to come to that place of seeing Jesus is God and we're just sinful. And we need to say, I repent of my sinfulness and I turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I find there's a wave going across around today that people don't want to talk about repentance anymore. They don't like repentance. You know, the Bible's full of it. The Bible's full of it. We need to repent. And it doesn't mean we have to say, oh, I'm gonna, you've got to number down everything you've done in your life and number every sin and you've got to turn away from it all and give it all up before you can get saved. Well, that's not true. No, you've got to repent as in say, I know I'm a sinner. I'm going to turn to the Lord. I know I've done stuff wrong. I'm going to turn to Christ. I don't, can't remember everything I've done. I've done so much wrong. I've got to repent that I was a sinner. I am a sinner and I'm going to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what real repentance is. It's a change of mind. It's not a matter of uh, 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 dealing with it. You can't deal with sin in your own self. It's impossible. And so we have to come to the cross with our sinfulness. Say, Lord, what a wretch I am, but I come to God. I come to the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross and I believe that he took all my sin on himself. He bare my sin in his own body on the tree and he was buried and he rose again from the dead. He did the work for me on, at, at the cross. He did a great work of salvation at the cross. I was preaching this morning how that uh, all, the, all the crowd were saying, well, if thou be the Son of God, come down off the cross and save yourself and save us also. And uh, if Jesus did that, that would have been an easy miracle. You know what he did? He stayed on the cross till he died and he paid for our sin and he did a greater miracle. He went to the grave and he rose again from the dead. That's a much greater miracle. Much fantastic miracle that he can come back up out of the grave. And, uh, and so we need to see he did it all for us. And we repent from our unbelief and we turn to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I know I don't believe you. I want to turn, help my unbelief. Isn't that what the man says? Lord, I believe you, help my unbelief. 
I want to repent from my unbelief and turn to you and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to come to the cross to be saved. Uh, Jesus blotted out our sin debt on the cross. Colossians 2.14 said, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He, he uh, uh, <clears throat> blotted out our hand, the handwriting of ordinances. You know what that handwriting was? It's the law. The Ten Commandments is the handwriting of ordinances, rules that are against us, telling us, you know, you break the law, you're condemned. In fact, uh, if we wanted to get saved according to the Old Testament, we've got to be perfect, and I guarantee you that no one's going to do it. No one's going to do it. And when the unsaved person says, I don't need Christ, you said, well, you better know the Old Testament law because you've got to complete it. And you're not going to do it because you failed already. You denied Christ. And, uh, but uh, uh, he blotted out our sin debt on the cross. Uh, Jesus redeemed us through the cross. He purchased us. He brought us back. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He redeemed us through the cross. That is, he purchased us back. We were his creation from the very beginning. He made us uh, from the very beginning and yet we were away from him and he paid for us again to buy us back to himself. In other words, he owned us first. It's a, bit, a little bit like uh, the boy that uh, had a little sailing boat. And I don't know if you've heard this story one. But the little boy that had the sailing boat and he's down the creek and he's enjoying his sailing boat and the creek caught it and washed it away and he's like, I lost my sailing boat. It just took off. And about a, a couple of weeks later, he was down, the, down in the town and he said in the second hand shop, he said, there's my sailing boat in the shop for $2. And he goes into the shop and says, sir, that's my sailing boat. And the man says, if you buy it back, you can have it. So the boy goes and finds two bucks and buys his sailing boat back. He redeemed it. He purchased it back. It's a bit like uh, your money is supposed to be a note of redemption. It's a redemptionary note. Did you know that? Money is supposed to be a redemptionary note that if you take your money to the bank, you should be able to claim your $5 worth of gold again. You might just get a sprinkle, but that's about it. But uh, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a, a note to say, we hold your gold and here's a note to, that says we've got your gold and you bring that note back and we'll give you back your gold. But now it doesn't work that way, does it, brother? They just print it and print it and print it. They don't care anymore. And uh, it's just not worth that much at all anymore. But that's what it's supposed to be. And G Jesus says, you're my creation and I paid for you to buy you back. And we've got to allow him to redeem us through his cross. Uh, thirdly, we see Jesus reconciles us through the cross. Reconciliation. Uh, Colossians 1.20 said, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Ephesians 2.16 says the same, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. He's reconciling. We know what reconciling is, is when you have a bad relationship and someone helps repair that relationship. You know, uh, when you're having a, a spit over the fence with your next door neighbour, having a big neighbourly problem over the tree that's hanging over the fence, and you go to a, you can have a neighbour dispute centre, I think they have, where you can, you and your neighbour go to that centre and the dispute will reconcile the relationship and it is resolve the dispute between the two of you. You know, that's what it is. We're an enemy to God. We're born up angry at God. We're in rebellion against God. And God said, I'll put the Lord Jesus Christ there that, that can reconcile that relationship. Our relationship was broken, but yet through Christ we can be reconciled to God. Through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled back to, the Lord, to God himself. And so he reconciles us through the work on the cross through that blood that was shed on the cross. And uh, fourthly, we see Jesus makes us complete through the cross. He makes us complete. Colossians 2.10, he says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He makes us complete. You are completed. 
Uh, you know, when you think, oh, I'm so downcast and I'm so out of it and I, I'm so disjointed. No, in Christ you're complete. You might have some issues and difficulties to work through, but if we know our position in Christ, in the cross, we're complete in him. We've been made complete. It's just that you haven't caught up to yourself yet, that's all. That's the only problem. you just got to work through that thing. The flesh is in the way, but really you're complete in Christ. You've been made whole in Christ. There's, the, all your problems have really been dealt with. We just have to get there, that's all. But it's all completed. Your work of salvation is complete in the cross. Absolutely complete. It is no more to add to it. You cannot add to the work of salvation uh, in yourself. You can work all your life, but you won't add to salvation. You cannot. All these people that preach that you've got to do good works to be saved, they've got a problem. Uh, you can't, you're none of us are good enough. And so Christ is the one that came and he said, we're complete in him. We basically come to him and said, Lord, forgive me. And he said, you're complete. You've been made whole. You, you're, 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 your fullness has arrived. And so uh, our work of salvation is completely done, made complete when we come to the cross. So when we call upon Christ to save us, we, we, we come to the cross to be saved. We have to come to the cross. I see Paul the Apostle when he on the way to Damascus and Jesus met him in the way. You know what happened? He came to the cross. When you get saved, that's the day you actually come to the cross and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. You died for me. I'm trusting on you and to be my saviour. But then we get saved at the cross and we get carried away in life and we've got to understand as saved people, let it be as saved people, will we come to the cross? You know, as saved, we're already grown. We're everything, like I said. We, we're, we're, we've had our sin debt blotted out. We've been redeemed. We're reconciled. We've made complete. But as Christians in this position, will we still come to the cross? We've got to come to the cross every day. It's just simply coming to the cross. And uh, so when all said and done, we're at the end of the day, we need to just get back to where the Lord was crucified. We need to get back to the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1.18, he said, But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. The cross is your power. When you say, no longer I, but Christ that dwelleth in me. No longer I can do it, but Christ in me. The cross is the power of God to us. And uh, for we, we know in many things uh, uh, and in ourselves that we cannot do it. You can't do it. You can't do the work of God in yourself. We can try. We think we try. But, uh, you know, most of the times we just have to come back to the cross and say, Lord, you do it through me. I need you to do it through me. I can't do it myself. And, uh, and, and through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can do all things. Because, you know, it's at the cross is where we deal with sin. Uh, sister, my brother, you know, uh, don't, get, don't kid yourself. We still have a sin problem. It didn't go away. And guess what happens? You're going to wake up one day and find out, hey, I've got sin in my life. You know what you do? Go back to the cross. Pretty simple. Just get back to the cross and say, Lord, this is my sin. This is who I am. This is where I'm at. You know, it's at the cross. Our hearts will be healed. Have a broken heart. Have a sorrow in your heart. Get back to the cross and you see, how much has Jesus done for us? Maybe my sorrow is not that great after all. I've got a great saviour. He, he suffered everything for me on the cross. He suffered separation. He suffered uh, rejection. He suffered anguish. He, he suffered uh, torture. He suffered uh, abuse. He, he suffered everything you can think of at the cross. And we come back there and say, well, Lord, uh, here's my problem. I'll just bring it to you. I'll just bring you my problem. I'll bring you my grief and my sorrow. He'll heal our, our home situation. He'll heal our relationship with others. He, and, and, uh, and he'll get, enable us to begin to repent and change our ways. And, and it allows us through the cross to change our heart attitudes. And, that, and we come to the cross. For it's at the cross where we see our own folly. And that's where we'll see God's righteousness, not our own. It's not me, it's Christ. And so at the end of the day, when it's all done, we'll see we've just got to come back to the cross because it's at the cross we'll find our true purpose in life. As a Christian, you have a purpose. And you know what that is? All you've got to do is be a promoter of the cross. Just tell people, you've got to come to Jesus. It's Jesus on the cross. I have great abilities, but it's Jesus at the cross. That's all it is. 
Very simple, isn't it? And so uh, it's our hope, it's our stay. And, you know, in your life, you have trouble, we're going to face difficult times. I believe we're going to face difficult times as we go to the future. I believe it's going to get worse. I, I'm honest. I mean, it's going to get financially harder. It's going to get emotionally harder. It's, there's more attacks on us in more ways than one. Uh, workplace is going to be more difficult. And uh, there's going to be more restrictions, more pressures. But through the cross, it will give you your strength. Through the cross, you'll have your stay. Through the cross where others will be having a big and emotional fit and you'll say, no, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'll trust the Lord in this. And he'll be your strength. He'll be your stay. He'll be your hope in the days to come. And so my question would be, will you come to the cross today? Will you come to him today and say, Lord, not me, but I'm going to look to you at the cross. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for being so great. We thank you, Father, that you've done so much work for us on the cross. But I pray, Lord Jesus, you'd help us to come to you and uh, see Lord, there's the answer to my problem is that I've wandered away far from sin, far in sin. I've wandered far from Christ and I need to come back to you and say, Lord, it's you on the cross. Not me, but you on the cross is my answer. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be there today in Jesus' name. Amen.